Hey guys, welcome back on a very cold day. You're on the grounds of the National Cathedral and uh, we start most of our hikes there because it's across the street from my house and because, well, as you can see, it's rather pretty. Yes, there is a Darth Vader gargoyle up on to the left, the left tower about three-fourths of the way up, there is a small Darth Vader gargoyle. You can actually buy that from the gift shop. So we are out for our hike. It is really cold. It is below zero, well, below zero Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit. And uh, we've got a scarf on, so hopefully, hopefully we'll get a chance to take the scarf down a bit. And we're going to start a tour of famous spy locations in Washington, D.C. So our first location, folks, is right across the street. That is known as Alban Towers. Alban Towers was a hotel back in the 1930s, 1940s, and it entertained some very famous guests, like Frank Sinatra actually stayed here, and many other celebrities. However, in the early 1930s, there was one guest, naval attache, Taman Yamaguchi. Taman Yamaguchi was the naval attache from the Japanese government at the embassy from uh, 1935, 1936 era. He was suave. He was like a Japanese James Bond, spoke English fluently, very well mannered, well versed, and everybody, including the FBI, thought he was a spy. One day the FBI decided to go into his apartment and they could find absolutely nothing that implicated him as a spy. Nothing. But they were still very suspicious. In 1936, the Japanese government, kind of feeling that he was probably exposed, decided to recall him back to Tokyo. A few years later, while in Tokyo working with the Japanese Navy, he came up with an idea with several other guys on attacking the U.S. fleet in Pearl Harbor. He was one of the architects of the Pearl Harbor attack. Now, he didn't live long to enjoy it because about six months later, at the Battle of Midway, he was the commander of the Hiryu, one of the four Japanese aircraft carriers that was sunk. If you've seen the Battle of Midway movie, the last aircraft carrier sank on the Japanese side. The captain went down with his ship. That captain was Mr. Hamaguchi, who's lived right over there. So, a little bit of World War II history, spiced in with a little bit of spy history. So we're going to walk down this road towards the Russian embassy, former Soviet embassy, and see what stuff. Now, we've seen some of this stuff in recent hikes around the area. So if you're a regular watcher, you might see a few things that repeat, but I'm going to show you some new stuff today, some stuff that I've never shown you before. Now, let's stop here for a second. Oh, we're on Fulton Street, too. So this nondescript apartment building was the home of a woman named Jennifer Miles. Jennifer Miles, back in the 1970s, was a diplomat with the South African Embassy, but just sort of a, a entry-level kind of diplomat. She was about 25, 26 years old, and she was described as one of the most beautiful women ever to arrive in Washington, D.C. Now, unbeknownst to many people, she was also quite enamored with the Cuban Revolution. And she fancied herself somewhat as an operative for Fidel Castro and all the others down in Cuba. Now, what did she do? Well, she decided that she would try to get some information from individuals using whatever means necessary. The FBI got wind of this when a rather old portly bureaucrat reported that the most beautiful woman in Washington was after him for information. Uh, 15 minutes after he was seduced. <laughs> now, he knew what was going on. The FBI started to tail her. They started to count on all the people that visited her. And after it got to about 100, they said, okay, let's stop counting and let's, uh, let's roll this up. She turned out to be just sort of some sort of amateur kind of spy, not really a professional agent. She went back to South Africa and lived in obscurity. But uh, when it broke that there was a beautiful young diplomat spying for the communists. Of course, there was lots of publicity in the newspapers. 
down here is another story. I actually showed you guys this the other day, but uh, we're going to stop here again just because it's kind of interesting. And nobody really knows if it's true anyway. The Russian embassy is behind these buildings. The Russian embassy is actually a giant diplomatic compound with an embassy, a consulate, and even living facilities for the Russian employees. It is widely spoken that a tunnel was built from an FBI safe house under the Russian embassy. Now, the FBI had two known, not safe houses, but operational houses next to the Russian embassy. One of them I'm going to show you in a minute, and it is still operational as an FBI house. The other one was right here, 3814 Fulton Street. The house has been torn down and replaced with this very nice, modern-looking three-story building. But it is believed this may have been the entrance to the Russian tunnel. Because that building right there, that white building you see in the distance, that's the Russian embassy. So. <laughs> nah. So the tunnel's existence was disclosed in a trial of a spy who leaked the information to the Russians. The tunnel's code name was Operation Monopoly. It's said to be big enough that an adult human could walk through the tunnel under the Russian embassy. Now, the FBI director has said that there was no uh, valuable intelligence ever gained from that tunnel's existence. But they didn't fill it in. They just sealed off the entrance. So as far as we know, the tunnel is still there. When the old U.S. Embassy in Moscow was renovated, they found several tunnels under it as well. <laughs> it's just all part of the game. Off of my left, you can start to make out a red brick house in the distance there. And that red brick house is known widely as an FBI operations house. I don't think I'm going to go inside the Russian embassy. Though, to be honest, the Russians are probably listening to this broadcast. <laughs> Now, it's well known that the FBI operates out of that house across the street. It is still an active FBI property. Now, it's also strongly suggested that in this apartment building, there are one or two apartments overlooking the Russian embassy that are also owned and operated by the FBI. Now, I haven't got confirmation on that. Well, I've heard about that a couple different sources. It's not like you can look up the leases in the government... Uh, property database for FBI houses. <laughs> now we're going to wait a second so we don't get killed. Good on the left. More or less good on the right. Let's cross the street. Breaking the law. Breaking the law. For those of you in another country, this is a U.S. mailbox. All right, this will become relevant in about 10 minutes. Not that specific mailbox, but a mailbox in general. So over there, guys, that's the Russian embassy. That's a former Veterans Administration hospital that was declared surplus, and it was actually going to pop. It's kind of falling apart, and then the Russians stepped in and bought it and turned it into the Russian embassy. This is a homeless guy. As soon as the Russians did that, the FBI came over and obtained this property. Now, the shades are always down. There's like camera footage, private property signs, stay away, stay away. And people have seen cameras up in the windows sometimes. So that building just screams, you are not welcome. And this is generally regarded as the FBI safe house. Now, some people think that the tunnel extends from here under the street into the Russian embassy. But that would have to go under a major road and then cross all that land just to get to the Russian embassy. That's why other people think the Fulton Street address is a more probable location for the tunnel. But like most things in spycraft, you're never actually going to find out exactly where the tunnel is going to be. It's 
So this camera here is actually just a traffic camera, but on top of it is a spy camera. And there's several of these cameras all over the place. I'm on like, I can't count how many times they film me. Because <laughs> I walk here all the time. All right. So we're going to go down here. Now, if you've got a good ear, that actually sounded like Russian. What happens, Russia is one of the few countries that sends all their families over as diplomats. So like the husband will be a diplomat and the wife will be a secretary. Or the wife is a diplomat and the husband is a driver. Everybody works. So everybody lives together, works together. And there's lots of young Russian families. Pretty much, I don't know, the majority of families I see walking on this sidewalk with little kids are speaking Russian. <laughs> If you like, you want to meet a nice Russian mom or something, this is where you come. <laughs> They're always out walking the kids. So this is the Whole Foods market. There's also a Safeway down the street. Both Whole Foods and Safeway have been used for dead drops and active drops between agents and uh, spies who have been handing off documents. They've arrested spies and found out that documents were passed or shopping carts were passed with documents inside them. I showed you this the other day. This is a place called Good Guys. And, well, let's just say good guys don't go to this place. <laughs> Bachelors on the night of their wedding go to this place, yeah? You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, the other people that love to go there are Russians. The Russian diplomats love to go down to Good Guys. And outside here, you used to find FBI cars all the time during the Cold War. They were bummed out because indoors, the Russians were eating chicken wings and drinking shots and watching the show. And outdoor, the FBI guys were eating, like, stale coffee and stuff like that. <laughs> hmm. Let's see if we can find this thing. Uh, I think it was right here. I think it was right here. All right, guys. We'll go across the street. So we're behind the Washington International School. Yeah, I'm making puffer jets a lot. Now, in 1993, was it? I think it was 1993. The uh, CIA discovered they had a mole. The mole's name was Aldrich Ames, and he was passing secrets to the Russians. It was 93 or 2000, I can't remember exactly. Now, I think it was 93. The Russian embassy, as you guys remember, is just up the street, and Aldrich Ames was over here. There was a mailbox at this intersection, 37th and R. And Aldrich Ames and his Russian handler worked out a signal. If there was a chalk X mark on the mailbox, that meant documents needed to be passed or a meeting needed to be arranged. So every day, the Russian consulate guy would drive up this street, glance at the mailbox, and know if his spy, his asset, needed to talk. So the mailbox became quite famous for a while. But then, due to cutbacks, the post office removed it. Bummer a little piece of forgotten spy lore at that intersection. <laughs> Here it is. Um, mostly brick, but there's a few wooden houses. Okay, guys, you see this little tiny house here. 1610 34th Street. 1610 34th Street. The man who lived in that house was named Roald Dahl. He wrote books like Matilda, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. But before he was a famous kid writer, he actually worked for the British Intelligence Service. Dahl was what was known as part of the Irregulars, a group of British officers who served in the United States designed to combat disinformation and propaganda and bring the United States into the war effort with a European focus. He worked with a wild cast of characters. And one of his jobs was to work on the congresswoman, Claire Booth Luce. You guys have heard of Dahl before, haven't you? He lived right there. Claire Booth Luce was a prominent isolationist politician, heir to the Luce fortune. And Dahl, um, Dahl, how do I say? Well, he had a very close relationship with her and was able to put forward the British line of thinking 
in an intimate surrounding. <laughs> This is a nice area. Now down here actually was one of Dahl's friends. Another British guy worked with him down here. Now another guy who worked on the uh, Irregulars was named, was it David Ogilvy, I guess was his name? David Ogilvy? Of Ogilvy and Mather, which is one of the largest. Uh, down here was a famous spy case one side of the spy case was known as Whitaker Chambers. The other was a gentleman named Alger Hiss. And Alger Hiss lived in this building, this white house with the black shutters, 3415 Volta Place. Alger Hiss was a US government employee who originally was working with the Russians, but he got called up. He eventually got somewhat disillusioned but then he was called up by the House Un-American Activities Committee in a huge, big kerfuffle. And he was determined to be lying before the House Un-American Affairs Committee. And it was a huge, huge debate. And that took place, he used to live right there. That is the Nixon. Now, this next, this is Volta Street, yeah? The next person who lived on Volta Street, we don't know exactly where he lived. We know he lived here because he was close friends with Roald Dahl, and he was actually working with Dahl. But he eventually became very close friends with a guy named Ian Fleming. That man's name was Ivor Bryce. Ivor Bryce was another British spy who was involved in the Irregulars, who uh, lived here on, hey puppy, who lived here on Volta Street. Now, Ivor Bryce had a contribution. Some people say, I think Roald Dahl said that probably 50% of the character of James Bond is actually Ivor Bryce. So Ian Fleming and Ivor Bryce were friends for many, many years. And if you look at some of the dedications, in Ian Fleming's books, he actually dedicates portions to Ivar Bryce. And most interesting, Ivar Bryce's middle name is Felix. And for those who are James Bond aficionados, you know who Felix is. Felix Leiter, CIA, James Bond's U.S. companion slash compatriot. And he was named after Ivar Bryce. And he lived on this street. <laughs> This is a really beautiful house. I don't know the whole history of it. I know it sold for like 25 million, like 10 years ago. It's humongous. And on the other side of the street is the Tudor Mansion, which is actually run by the National Park Service now. And I want to say that like they were related to George Washington by marriage. Georgetown is not the most expensive neighborhood. There's another neighborhood called Calorama, where the houses are bigger and far, far more expensive. It's mostly diplomats. That's where Ivanka Trump lives, lived. That's where Barack Obama has a house. It's incredibly expensive. In Georgetown, you can still, I mean, there are incredibly expensive houses here. Don't get me wrong. Some of these big monsters you're looking at are $10 million. I'm not kidding. These are easily seven to $10 million, these corner houses. But uh, you can still find places, a million and a half, two million dollars as well. Calorama, on the other hand, is crazy expensive. Which one, that one? You like that building? They do a really good Halloween display at that house every year. I used to live down this street many, many moons ago. 
This is where I, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger came to my house. I told you guys, I told some of you that story. So one, one year, they were filming the movie True Lies with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Tom Arnold, here in Georgetown, okay? Arnold rented a house for like two months for the filming of the movie. And that just happened to coincide with Halloween. So I was living in Georgetown and the doorbell rang and I go to the front door and there's this little tiny girl dressed as Barney. And she just like looks at me when I open the door and she just doesn't say anything. And I said, would you like some candy? And she nodded. And so I put the bowl of candy down in front of her. And then her father who was with her was wearing like a hoodie and a leather jacket. He says, take only one. And I look up, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger standing in my front doorway. I'm like, oh, this is kind of wild. And then she takes a piece of candy and he says, what do we say? And the little girl goes, trick or treat. <laughs> he just laughs. He's like, no, no, we say danka. And the little girl says, thank you. <laughs> and then they walked away. <laughs> My one brush with Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was filming a spy movie here in Georgetown. We all knew he was here because at the time, nobody had a Hummer. He had the first Humvee, the first civilian Humvee ever made was given to Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he used to drive around these narrow streets in Georgetown smoking a cigar in his Humvee. <laughs> it was kind of wild. True Lies was just one of these fun movies you can watch on the weekend. It's not like the meaning of life or anything like that. I think he got paid with an airplane. I think I read that he got paid with a Learjet. <laughs> that, was his, uh, that was his payment. All right, we got to go down another two blocks and then up a block, up a long uphill block. Hmm. That's a nice house. I think that's an apartment. No, that's one house. God, that's massive. That is a massive house. Hmm. I go block too far. may have gone a block too far. Oh well. It all works out in the end. Well, Georgetown is an old area of DC, dating back to the times of the settlement of the country almost. Most of the houses were built in the 1800s. Well, there are a few that were built earlier than that. Huh. Shoot. So we're coming up to 29th and R. Actually, I thought we were 30th and R, but this will work. There's a couple of famous houses around here. I've shown you a couple of these houses before, but we'll do it in this. <laughs> okay. Here we go, 2920 R Street. 2920 R Street, most recently known as the home of Catherine Graham, the publisher of the Washington Post. It wasn't from these walls that the decisions on the Pentagon Papers and Watergate were made. Catherine Graham entertained many of Washington DC's social and political elite here at this house. But prior to that, this house was owned by a man known William Donnelly, or to his friends, Wild Bill Donnelly. 
Wild Bill Donnelly was the founder of the OSS, the precursor to the CIA. He was a legend in the military, Medal of Honor winner. I think he won all four of the meritorious um, service, like the most uh, bravery type awards in the military. And uh, he went on to lead the OSS and the CIA. And this is where Bill Donnelly lived before they sold the property to Catherine Graham. Now let's go down this side street here because also in this neighborhood are two other CIA directors. Who also were both OSS. He is buried at Arlington Cemetery, though I can't get over there right now. He had quite a distinguished career. I know his grandson died in Vietnam, so I don't know if he has any surviving kin. So this is Dent Street, D-E-N-T, the 3000 block of Dent. And we're gonna go over there. I haven't done the Appalachian Trail. I just got too much stuff going on. It would be fun to hike it all though. I hear it's really tough to do the whole thing. So over here is 3028 Dent Street. 3028 Dent Street was the former home of Bill Colby, C-O-L-B-Y. Colby was the director of the CIA under uh, Ford and Carter. He was the one who uh, instituted a lot of the reforms of the CIA that were made possible by the Church Commission. And he was replaced as the head of the CIA by George Bush who became the next director of the CIA. So that's where Bill Colby lived. The other CIA director was Bill Casey. He lived over in Calorama. We'll see his house a bit later. But there's one more CIA director who lived down the street here. So we'll go see his house. And then, how do we know that? This is all public knowledge. All this stuff is uh, public known, publicly known, written about in newspapers, the spy magazines, not only the spy museum, has done presentations. There's actually a book called Spy Sites of Washington, D.C. It's a really good book if you're interested. You can find out a lot more about Washington, D.C. spy sites. Maybe I should have a giveaway and give away the book or something. <laughs> the Spy Museum is down by the National Mall. Yep. There it is. That is 2723 Q Street. And that is the home of Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles was the CIA director back in the time of Kennedy. He was the longest serving CIA director in history. And he lived here. His brother was the Secretary of State, was it? And Foster Dulles. But Alan lived here. Alan Welsh Dulles. He was in charge of the Bay of Pigs operation, and when that failed rather miserably, he took the rap and he resigned. Being renovated, I should say. So over there on my right, you guys see that little yellow house. Back in World War II, there was a person who wanted to help out the country. And they applied to be like a work with airplanes and stuff, but they were too tall. They were really a tall person. So they said, we can't get you a job there. They said, but there's this new organization called the OSS and they could use you. So they went over to the OSS in sort of an administrative role, really just kind of almost like a typist, but they were very well educated, very well spoken and quickly caught the attention of Bill Donovan, who moved them up the ranks of the OSS. Eventually, 
they went over to China, started working with the organizations over there, Kuming and stuff, China. And while there, this agent was tasked with cooking up a concoction to keep sharks away from underwater mines. Because the, the little explosives they were using over in China, the sharks would come up and detonate them. So they cooked up a little bit of an invention to keep the sharks away, a shark repellent. Now cooking became a big deal for this person when they moved to France. And they decided no longer to be a spy, but to be a chef. Do you guys know who I'm talking about? Julia Child. This was the house of Julia Child, one of the most famous chefs, one of the most famous cooks. Julia Child lived here as a young woman. She eventually married, I guess his name was Peter Child when she met him in China. And that is Julia Child's house, the spy who liked to cook. <laughs> that is Julia Child's house. Her first house in Washington, D.C. She had a couple others, but that was the first one. No, it's not a museum. It was a rental house. And actually, it was kind of funny. The guy who used to rent it said that he would have roommates who just came to live there because they were such fans of Julia Child, even though the house was beyond decrepit. It was really run down. Somebody just bought it and renovated it, and they're going to live there, I guess. But uh, that's well known as the Julia Child house. Okay, let's cut into downtown D.C. now. Oh, what do we have down here? Oh, yeah, we're at the Watergate. <laughs> kind of forgot that we got... Yeah, it must be a chain, I guess. So up on my right is where the Democratic National Committee headquarters was. And over on my left is the Howard Johnsons, or the former Howard Johnsons. The Watergate burglars had a command center. I think it was room 723 of the Howard Johnsons, and they could see over to this side and see the burglars making their way through the Democratic National Committee headquarters. Uh, there's multiple entrances. The hotel entrance is there. There's a Ferrari there. <laughs> so uh, George Washington University used to own that building, and they would allow the top student in political science to live in room 723, the burglar's room. And it had lots of memorabilia about the Watergate break in. If you watch closely the movie Forrest Gump, Forrest Gump stayed in that Howard Johnson's <laughs> and uh, called in the Watergate burglars to the DC police. This is the Saudi embassy right over here, by the way, the Saudi Arabian embassy. And behind that is the Kennedy Center. Benito Juarez. Hmm. Oh, well, hello. We can see it from here. Very interesting. <laughs> okay, guys. Can you see off in the distance a red brick building with a small little dome on the roof? Oh, that statue is uh, Benito Juarez. That building over there is the original CIA headquarters. That was the OSS slash CIA headquarters in Washington, D.C. I believe the address is 2520 E Street. E is in Edward. And I believe it's still operational. I believe there are CIA people working in that building and the building behind it as well. Both of those buildings are still in use by the CIA. Homeless camp. These things are everywhere in D.C. Let's go over here, see what we can see. Oh, shit, he's doing it. 
The escalators at Union Station are pretty gross. So I don't know how close I can get. This road kind of dead ends. But that red brick building straight ahead, and there's a sandstone, limestone colored building behind it. Those were the original headquarters of the OSS CIA on the grounds of the U.S. Naval Observatory. The, the observatory has moved. That's the old observatory. Now it's like Naval Medical Command or something like that. Hello, Sweden. So that's the red brick building where the OSS CIA got its start. And I'm told CIA is still there. Union Station is about th three or four miles from here. So let's go, let's go over to the State Department where there was a Russian spy doing some weird stuff a few years back. Virginia and 21st, we're almost there. I was down here yesterday filming the president's motorcade. Okay, so this little park here, I believe it's called Kelly Park. A few years back, there was a Russian diplomat called Stanislav Gusev. And he would park his car over here and go into the park and read the Washington Post upside down. <laughs> Literally, he had the newspaper upside down. He was uh, fiddling with a briefcase and then he would go back and pump some coins into the meter and then come back, read his paper and fiddle with the briefcase some more. It was later discovered that he was operating a secret microphone that was inside the furniture of the State Department in one of the rooms. They had put a microphone inside like the table and this Russian diplomat would sit out here with his little backpack and tune in to the conversations going on inside the State Department. He was, of course, expelled for doing stuff not part of the diplomatic mission, but the question of who put the microphone in the State Department was never publicly revealed. One of those big mysteries. <laughs> and that took place right here at 21st and Virginia Avenue. Yes, very creative. Now, yesterday you saw me film the vice president or the president's uh, motorcade making its way to the NIH to see Dr. Fauci, and the president's motorcade went right down this street, past this one of the largest homeless camps near the White House. The government puts out toilets, hand wash stations. Well, there are many, many people living in these tents. Yeah, some of them are just filled with trash. The White House is, uh, what is this, 20th Street? So the White House is three, four blocks up the street. I was actually standing right over there in that park when I filmed the motorcade go by into this uh, road. Hmm, this would have been a better place to stand. I just didn't have enough time to get positioned. It was pure luck that I ended up being here. Here are those moving bus ads. They've been displaying FBI wanted posters for the last couple of weeks. This is the pipe bomber. 
Uh, wrap the video is a little fuzzy. Uh, it'll come back and forth depending on the bandwidth. Let's go down over here. You know, I'm not even sure if this place is still here. Uh, it should be. This place was like an institution, but it might have died because of uh, because of all the COVID shutdowns. Next block. I used to have an office over here many, many years ago. Hmm. It looks open. So, guys, this little place on my left with the uh, dining domes is a bar known as The Exchange. Now, The Exchange has been here for Oh God, I don't know, 40 or 50 years? Yeah, DC's oldest sports saloon. However, <laughs> this was opened by two Czechoslovakian uh, spies, basically. They were illegal spies. They weren't part, of, they were like, they would, they're, they would be disacknowledged or whatever if they got arrested. They wouldn't be covered by whatever rules existed. And they ran the exchange. And one of their big clients at the exchange was an organization called Capital Couples. All right? Capital Couples at a place called The Exchange. Are you guys kind of getting the idea of what went on here? You should. Okay. So they ran a little intelligence gathering operation based on their, uh, their desires. <laughs> And we're able to ensnare a few people with uh, behavior that probably wouldn't be approved on most of the uh, top secret security clearances. So that place has a little bit of a strange history. <laughs> Across the street is the entrance to the White House. Over there is also Blair House, where the vice president is currently staying. And we are actually not even going to go to the White House today. Well, it looks like they've taken down... No, they're still working on the construction. We're going to bypass the White House today and make our way up the street. This building, by the way, is the new, the new executive office building. This is the old executive office building, which is also known as the wedding cake building because it looks like a wedding cake. But that's where all the president's staff uh, work and have their offices. The new executive office building is where the Secret Service are based and the National Security Council. Yeah. There we are. Also on the roof, I think I've mentioned this before, on the roof of that building is a missile battery. Some close in air defense of the city. And this guy up here is selling Trump and Biden sweatshirts. All sorts of tourist stuff. The Trump stuff is falling by the wayside. He doesn't have it out of it now. He's got some Kamala Harris stuff. Now this next little place, most people don't know about this place, <laughs> but this red brick building is or was the headquarters of the Alibi Club. The Alibi Club, and they still have the sign on the door, Alibi Club. The Alibi Club is limited to 50 members. All members must be unanimously voted in by all other members. And it is a who's who of the national intelligence and defense and political authority of the United States. The Secretary of Defense, the CIA Director, the Chief of Staff, they all have membership in this super exclusive alibi club where they can meet up and discuss things in private outside of prying eyes. 
This is right across from Farragut West. So let's start heading up this way. What time is it? Check the watch. Ooh, we've been at this a couple hours. Uh, oh, my phone's going. So guys, I tell you what. I am going to stop the Periscope, but I'm going to keep the YouTube going. So if you guys want to watch on YouTube, it'll be up a little bit later. I need to save the battery on my phone. Now for the YouTubers, I think you see what I see. I think you know what I'm thinking too. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel like walking. Kids need to get something to eat. So let's see if we can get one of these. Uh, yep. We are renting a scooter. This is going to take us back up. Da -da -da -da. Oh, it's got a weak battery, though. Should have got a better one. 39%. That should get us where we need to go, though. baby now we're not allowed to ride on the sidewalks downtown so we got to find a bike lane okay we're gonna go up the embassy row now so basically almost everything you're gonna see for the next 10-15 oh, minutes are gonna be embassies or related to embassies for example up here on the left is the embassy of Portugal and the Embassy of Portugal is next to the Embassy of Indonesia, which is a beautiful old building. This is all Indonesia. And over on the right-hand side is the Embassy of India. They've had a lot of protests lately. You know, there's a lot of farmers having protests in India. And a lot of those supporters have actually come to the embassy to protest as well. You also see uh, Gandhi walking there on the statue. This is the, so the Society of Cincinnati, which is descendant of colonial military officers, kind of like a Daughters of the American Revolution. They have a really cool museum, though, in the basement on the history of the Revolutionary War. This is a Czech statesman from President of Czechoslovakia, 1918-1935. See, we do stop for red lights occasionally. That's the old Estonian embassy over there. I think it's being renovated right now. I think this is Luxembourg on the left, and the de Turkish Defense Attaché's office is left. And we'll see what else we can find. Here we go. There's another uh, spy kind of story up here, I'll tell you in a minute. As we go past these embassies. Was that Togo? Uh, Benin or something? I can't remember. I couldn't see the sign. The Greek embassy is over on my right. And we just passed Bahamas. And here on my left is the Irish embassy. And it's right over here by the Irish embassy. Let's see if we... Here's the plaque. This plaque. This plaque is dedicated to Orlando Letlier 
and who's the other woman? Ronnie Moffat. They were working for the Chilean, and it was the Chilean ambassador and one of the aides for President Allende, who was overthrown by the Pinochet government. See one yeah. day, and his car exploded right there where you saw that plaque between the Irish and Romanian embassies. So a car bomb killed the former Chilean ambassador, and it was pretty much laid to, pretty much thought to be the Pinochet's men who had done it, though I don't think it was ever formally prosecuted in the U.S. because uh, relations were sensitive at the time. Now there's a house up here. Hang on a second. Oh, what do we have over there? We have the uh, Philippines and Vietnam. I think that's Egypt. I've got to grab something out of my pocket. I need another glove. It's so cold. Okay. Oh, let's see if we can find this house. 2501. So I'm on that side of the street. Okay, just getting our gloves set. Oh, Kenya, Vietnam, Philippines. I thought this was Egypt. I'm not entirely sure because I think Egypt moved. It might be the old one. This is uh, Chile right there, then Haiti, and then the former Pakistani embassy, which is being used for something else right now. I think it's on the market. Over here is Burkina Faso. And up here is the Kyrgyz Republic, which I think we used to call Kyrgyzstan. Now it's the Kyrgyz Republic. That's that red flag. Over on the right is Croatia. And then this is the Korean, Korean Cultural Affairs uh, section of their embassy. And over there <laughs> is a fun little story. Right now, what you see is Camero Cameroon's embassy, the embassy of Cameroon. That used to be Czechoslovakia's embassy. One day, a Czechoslovakian spy was working with the FBI. The FBI borrowed a garbage truck. Yeah, borrowed a garbage truck, drove onto the grounds, and the Czechoslovakian spy through a cipher machine and a whole reef of documents into the trash truck. The trash truck then left without ever picking up the trash, and the FBI got a hold of a secret code from the Czech Republic. It was said that the Czech security guy then had to go to the Russian embassy later that day and borrow their cipher to file a report that his had been stolen. <laughs> That's the embassy of Chad. That's the Dutch ambassador's house. Jeff Bezos lives back there too. Ivory Coast, and let's keep making our way up this hill. This is the Mexican mission to the Organization of the American States. So that's sort of like, not an embassy, but it's like a diplomatic post. And that's the uh, Venezuelan ambassador's house. I'm not sure who lives there because we don't really like the current government of Venezuela. This is the South Korean embassy. There was a Korean uh, spy once who was uh, caught red-handed there catching some secrets from an American spy. And up here is the Japanese embassy, the old Japanese embassy, where it is said on December 7th, 1941, the American security services noticed people burning documents and machines here at the Japanese embassy. This is also, I think, was the Japanese ambassador's residence, but he's now moved. Whoa, it's a little cold. Over on your right, you see the Turkish ambassador, or the Turkish embassy. The Turkish ambassador was back by where the Chilean guy got blown up. And let's go back behind the mosque here. The Islamic Center of Washington, D.C. is over here. 
because behind it is something cool that I've shown you many times. Here we go. This red brick building here on the right is the Russian Defense Attaché's house. The Russian Defense Attaché is where they do all their spying. Americans who are wanting to like work with the Russians have actually been filmed going up into this building by FBI watchers who are in the area. But this is where the Russians do all their spying. Now behind this house is where Ivanka Trump lived and just down this street behind that Secret Service car is where Barack Obama has his house. I don't go down there because, well, they don't take too kindly to tourists. Ooh, up we go. Now the big uphill part. Thankfully I'm on this scooter. <laughs> So now we're going over Rock Creek Parkway again. This is a beautiful park. It's run by the National Park Service. It's like 1,700 acres. There are deer and coyote in this park. It connects, it's sort of also can bring animals down into the heart of the city. There's been deer at the White House, actually, that have came down through Rock Creek Park. So over on our left, what do we got? We got the Italian embassy on our immediate left. Hillary Clinton lives at the end of that street. Then we have the Brazilian ambassador's house. It's a pretty nice looking place. Next to the Brazilian ambassador is the Brazil embassy. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I always call that Brasilia because it looks so modern compared to the old ambassador's place. This place on the right is the former Iranian ambassador's house. And this building is the former Iranian embassy. Now, these buildings are maintained by the U.S. State Department as we don't have diplomatic relations with Iran. And as such, it's not technically an embassy. That's the Bolivian embassy. Over here is the South African embassy. And we talked about that South African spy earlier in the show. Here's the Mandela sculpture. sculpture. Now over there is the British ambassador's residence. At one time, most of the Cambridge spy, spy crew served in the Washington embassy. And uh, their shenanigans over here were well known. Oof. Let's make our way up this hill. It's getting colder and colder. This is the British Embassy under massive renovation right now. I think it's pretty much empty. With everybody work from home, it's pretty much the perfect time to renovate. A lot of the embassies are under renovation right now. Straight ahead is the U.S. Naval Observatory. This is the south entrance. Uh, this is the entrance closest to the White House. The helicopter landing pad is just up over that ridge. Just last week, they finally removed the uh, chain link fence, riot fence that was around here. You saw that in my videos the other day. Uh. So you're on Massachusetts Avenue right now, coming up to 34th Street. For those of you who've been following on a map. There's the Vice President's house, just up on that ridge. I don't see anyone working on the chimney right now. Not sure when she'll move in. As I mentioned, uh, Dick Cheney took one month to move into the Vice President's house. Al Gore actually waited six months while they were renovating the pipes and the water plumbing. 
that house is really quite old. There's a very exclusive neighborhood over there on the other side of those trees. Those are multi, multi-million dollar homes. I think we looked at one that was like 15 million over there. There's a vacant lot over there that's currently on the market for $4 million. Just a, a scrub of land. So here we are at the Finland Embassy. This is the happiest nation on earth, so they like to proclaim. This is the Finland guy is going to hit. And they have a little library where I often come to get books. This is the Vatican's Embassy, for lack of a better word. I think it has a different title than Embassy, but it's basically their embassy. And up here is Norway the Norwegian Embassy under major renovations right now. I think the Norwegian Ambassador and the Embassy are all kind of located in the same place. Uh, over there is the U.S. Naval Observatory main entrance. That's where the Vice President will be going in and out to uh, go to work. It's cold. Shoot. And I miss Bill Casey's house. Well, I got so excited telling you the story of the Cameroon Embassy of the Czech Republic. Gone too far. Gone too far. <laughs> okay, guess what? This stupid thing just geofenced me. <laughs> well, you know what? Screw you. Ugh. Well, I got geofenced, which means I can't go any farther. Battery is too low. Okay. Now, if you're interested in more about spies in Washington, D.C., there's a book, I believe, called Spy vs. Spy by a guy named Mike Kessler, who is a national security reporter for the Washington Post or other magazines. There is a book called Spy Sites of Washington, D.C., which is basically a tour guide to spy locations in Washington, D.C. And there's a lot of other books that have been written about the espionage community, the intelligence community in Washington, D.C., uh, that I'll try to put in the description below. I should add, none of the things that I showed you are classified. Most of them, of course, were historic. Most of the modern things that I've shown are not classified. They're all open. It's all visible. You can Google everything. It's all out there. <laughs> A lot of the other things I can't show you, well, I can't show you, I could, but they're far away. For example, the National Security Agency is up in Baltimore area. It's about a 30, 40 mile drive. The NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, is out in Dulles. Again, another half hour, 40 mile drive. And the Defense Intelligence Agency is down in Anacostia, which is part of DC, but it's pretty hard to get to. It's on a military base. It's one of the largest uh, buildings down there on that base. Let's walk up. Oh, that's pretty. Still can't figure out this camera. Well, guys, I'm thinking I'm going to sign off, go get some lunch, and start working on this video. Thanks a lot for joining me on this hike today. We do these a lot. We'll do some more next week. Thanks again. See you soon.